I'm Jay Miller, and today on George Fox Talks, we'll be discussing how Quakers approach listening to God and discerning vocation. Before getting into this conversation, we wanted to note that one of my guests, Greg Woods, is disabled, and his disability affects his speech. People who are not used to Greg's speech patterns may not understand what he's saying, so we wanted to note that the video version of this episode is captioned on YouTube. You can follow along there if you need to. One of the emphases of Quaker discernment is listening. And I'm grateful to Greg and his colleague, Jen Newman, for helping us think about how friends' convictions and practices can help us do that better. We hope you enjoy the episode, and thanks for listening today. I'm JDB David Miller, and today on George Fox Talks Culture, we're going to be talking with Jen Newman and Greg Woods, who are affiliated with Beacon Hill Friends House, uh, about a curriculum they've written called Living Into Your Call, which is um, a curriculum that's supposed to help people discern their vocation using Quaker discernment practices, um, but very much geared toward a broader audience, whether you're a Quaker or not. Um and as I was thinking about this project, um, which I'm really excited to talk about, I was thinking about something I heard about Quaker discernment years ago that was really helpful to me um, that I wonder if you, Jen and Greg, could respond to and just tell me what you think. Um, I took a discernment course with a woman named Jen, Jan Wood, which was really, really helpful for me. And one thing she said was that um, in a corporate discernment setting, she said that making a decision or discernment is not about making a decision. It's about becoming a people of God. And that was a really great shift for me or a really great point of emphasis on um, a lot of times when we're discerning things, we think about like, okay, what do I need to do? Um, but it's about a lot more than that. So I was curious if that's resonant with your own understanding of discernment kind of coming out of the Quaker tradition. Yeah. Um, it does for us, and one of the one of the words that we typically use around this is how are we being faithful? Um, so, like you said, sort of how do we become a people of God? As you're discerning between options and how you're supposed to move forward, it's not just about sort of making this decision, but making it with an eye toward how are we being faithful to the ways that God or Spirit is calling us. And in uh, in uh, the Quaker parts, it's about uh, uh, um, how do you how can we be faithful? We're in a community and be supported um, by a community to keep that faithfulness. Yeah, I, that's always been important for me is that discernment sort of process taking place in community. I've, I've been a part of a few different clearance committees for all kinds of different things, and we'll talk about clearance committees more as we get into the conversation. But bef before we get deeper, um, can you just tell us more about the origins of this project that you both work on, how it came to be, um, and how you two came to work on it together? I used to be working in Quaker Campus Ministry. I, I, I did that at Guilford College. And then um, I really felt uh, led to think about how can we reach uh, students with the Quaker masses at non-Quaker colleges. Mm -hmm. And colleges don't let anyone on to recruit students. So I would like, if they something we can offer college students. And just knowing myself uh, and knowing my uh, other young adults, I was in my early 30s at that time, we were all thinking about what am I doing with my life? Uh, what, uh, and I found out, I, I realized we have a lot to offer uh, the junior, uh, like college students who are trying to think about what they want to do and really be meaningful about that. <laughs> So and uh, I was looking to partner with someone in this work uh, because I am such a people person. Mm -hmm. I need to work with people to get projects done. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I happened to have a conversation with Jen uh, when she started working at Beacon Hill Fence House. Yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I started working at Beacon Hill Friends House. I had lived there for a while. So the Friends House is a Quaker center, um, an intentional community where about 20 people live according to Quaker values. And I serve as the program director. So I manage our, our public facing programs and also ways of supporting the spiritual formation um, of residents who are in our community. Um, and we had asked people sort of what are the ways that you want to learn and grow while you're a resident? And one of the questions people had was, well, you know, I have lots of career questions about what I'm going to do with my life. So what do Quakers have to say about that? Mm -hmm. um, and so Greg and I were in conversation about what we could offer our, our residential community. Um, and our community is intergenerational. So at um, our youngest resident right now is 21 and our oldest is in their uh, mid 60s um, and lots of grad students and a couple undergrads and um, people in retirement, different phases of their life. And so Greg and I had a conversation about what it might look like to provide them with some community practices and support. Um, especially uh, clearness committees and other processes. So we ran a pilot version for that and then thought sort of where else might we, might we use this curriculum? Where else might it be useful? Yeah. And so for people listening who may not know, um, you're doing this for a broader audience. You're doing this on college campuses for all different kinds of colleges from places like Fox to, um, you know, other places just around the country and even online, um, based on what you told me, can you say a little bit more about the, we'll get into practices, but I'm curious about the theological kind of Quaker background or the main Quaker ideas that you're drawing on to inform this, um, workshop that you run. Yeah, I can start. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I think I'll, I'll bring up actually a quote, um, that might be helpful. So mm. a big, part of our curriculum is um, guided by the Quaker principle that there's the light of God in all of us, or Quakers might call that the inward light of Christ or an inner teacher. So within us, we have the capacity to um, be in touch with God and to discern then what God is calling us to do. Um, there's a quote actually by George Fox um, that says, it's from George Fox's Epistle 19 from 1652, um, keep within and when they say, look here or look there is Christ, go not forth for Christ is within you. Um, and we can talk more about that quote too, but um, that's the, the under, underlying theological principle that that exists and that we have the ability to tap into that. And so that changes sort of the principles and practices around what we're doing in vocational discernment route back to how do we access that. Um, and I think it's really empowering in the framework of vocational discernment or career planning or what am I supposed to do in my life? Because I think... Um, if we talk about the college student age in particular, but really all of us, we're in an information age where there's lots of external things telling us, you know, take this test and you'll learn who you are or pitch yourself um, to your future employer. Um, use the, this language and not this language. This is how you do a resume and not, and not a lot of focus on sort of who do you want to be in the world? Who are you called to be? Who is God calling you to be in the world? And I think that the way that feels in your body um, and the way that you know what's true for you in that regard is really different than just consuming a lot of information and having a test tell you sort of where you're supposed to go um, and make processing external information. Um, and so I love how empowering it is to circle back to we have this wisdom of God within us and this is what it looks like to take in that information, hold it in community and really discern how we're going to be faithful to God's call for us in our lives. Do you have anything else? Yeah. Um, another day in this curriculum uh, in the theological underpinning is being, uh, like I said before, like being faithful to a community. And whether that is a church or a residential community or a really close group of friends or a group of mentors and like we live in a age of individuality and I think that is one of the radical things about Quakerism today is this uh, emphasis on community and uh, on community discernment. So even though we are talking about one's vocation, um, that can still be a community process because whenever we live into our gifts, we bear fruit for the whole community and uh, we can help support each other in uh, living fuller lives. Uh, I think once we do, our 
we don't our results have been a bit, but people who want us been a bit from us, like, being more happy, being more um, in tune to where we want to be in life. Um, I can really make a difference. Yeah, I, I think that's great what both of you each said, because it kind of brings out, I think, this paradox of discernment that it's rooted in... Um, my individual experience and my individual experience of God and my individual calling out of that experience. But um, that can't just, the, the, that experience also has a relationship with the external world. And I, I hear you saying, Jen, it's like, the key is finding like, what external are you aligning with? You know, are you aligning with like what your employer wants or like what a broader sort of culture says about like what your work should be or as Greg saw reporting out are you aligning with like a community that knows you and is committed to supporting you and also you know becoming a people of God sort of together um so I love that paradox and I think that flows really well into like the idea of clearness committees mm -hmm. so um can you explain what a clearness committee is and how you try to introduce that to people who may not be familiar with it in a workshop discernment setting? Yeah, I can give the basics and yeah. then I'll kick it over to Greg for some history. Yeah. Um, so the way that it works in our setting, so a clearness committee is an opportunity to gather a group of people with whom you trust or have a community or spiritual relationship with. So if you're a Quaker, this might mean other people from your meeting or other Quaker meetings in the area, um, but it doesn't have to be the people who are walking with you in your, in your journey. Um, and you gather a group of, I don't know, four or five people. And the purpose is that you can share what's on your heart, um, the questions that you're holding. And the people who are with you hold you in that questioning and ask you questions, reflect images, reflect sort of what they're hearing you say um, to help you get greater clarity on what how to be faithful or what your next step should be. Um, so sometimes people bring questions of um, our friend Callie Keith Perry, who we cite in our workbook, says, you know, how to prepare for a clearness committee. There might be two types of questions. So it would be a testing query or a fog clearing query. Um, and a testing query might be that you're bringing a question between a specific option. So say, you know, I'm graduating college and I have an acceptance to law school or divinity school. This is a personal example. Um, and sort of what path should I take? Um, I'm trying to decide, decide between these two really different options. Um, so bringing people together to hear your heart on those things and to try to, to give you questions that you might not have thought to ask yourself um, that can help shape your discernment. Um, so that would be a testing query. And a fog clearing query would be something like there feels like, you know, there's this, this fog of I'm not sure where to go forward. That might be... Um, you know, I'm in this job, I feel really ready to leave, but I'm not sure what comes next. And so that might be sort of setting the scene for where you are and having people help discern what um, what general direction you might move in. Um, and those questions tend to be more open-ended. But I think the huge value of a clearance committee in that setting is that you have other people who are there just to listen and hold you in those questions and really show up for you in that way. And the goal is not for people to give you advice to say, ah, oh, well, you should just go to law school because you'll make more money or some you know, answer to that question, but to really help you go deeper in your own discernment. And so they're showing up for you in this deeply spiritual way. Um, so that's that's how a clearness committee might work in this setting. Um, and I think that Greg does a great job of explaining sort of what these, how these come in Quakerism and what they're used for. Yeah, COVID discernment has always been a part of Quakerism, but uh, the former cl clearness committees is relatively newer uh, in terms of Quakerism. It has been in the last... Um, uh, uh, the senior editor of French Journal and Liberal Quaker Journal, um, Martin Kelly, wrote a post in 2018 um, on his blog uh, researching the history of clearance committees because people had a misconception that we had been doing it since the beginning of Quakerism. 
uh, in the 1650s, 50s, uh, but he has found uh, the first mention of clearance committees in the free journal, which started in 1955, was in the late 60s. Mm. Um, I was in reference to an article by uh, then young adult friends talking about uh, working together to help uh, people during the Vietnam War era think about what they wanted to do in terms of traps and resistance. And uh, clearance committees are known to be uh, like two, uh, two ways they come up, uh, in like Quaker meetings of uh, marriages and meeting membership. Um, now, but they can be used for big decisions, uh, whether or not, uh, do, uh, uh, what do do marry someone or like to do a big undertaking or like um as we were talking uh before I had a clearance committee about where to move um uh, in my late in my mid twenties I felt a leading to do something different with my life. Um, I do move out of a big city because it wasn't fitting with what I wanted in terms of a lifestyle. So I wanted a slower life than a big city living. Yeah, I, I appreciate that emphasis that even though historically, um, in recent, I think both longer history, like, kind of the corporate discernment is used around big decisions. Like for me, studying the 18th century, I think maybe a precedent for this, you know, might be, you know, if you wanted to get married in the meeting, you know, at that time there's a separate men's meeting and a separate women's meeting. So people from the women's meeting would go check in, you know, with the kind of woman potentially being married and vice versa for the men's meeting. But it wasn't necessarily like sitting down and kind of asking, you know, they're kind of like checking you out and making sure you were, you know, kind of fit for marriage and that the meeting could take this on. And then what I hear you saying, Greg, is that we kind of have this kind of post-war kind of new post-World War II in the context of the Vietnam War kind of growing out of that. Um, but they don't have to be for big decisions, like you're saying, or yeah. kind of even it can be for ordinary decisions. And one way I've heard someone talk about it is like, in some ways, in our relationships, in our communities, we kind of have many meetings for clearness all the time mm -hmm. with people we're close with and people we trust, whether that's like you're debriefing your day with your spouse or your partner or you see someone, um, you know, that you know around town and you talk to them with what you're going through. I think in in all of our friendships or relationships, we look for people who will just listen to us mm -hmm. and give us perspective while not sometimes we want advice but sometimes we just need perspective or good questions and i think the meeting for clearness can kind of just bring that together and give that a bit of a form but like a lot of kind of quaker kind of practices there are things that we hope kind of spread out into our daily life whether that's listening or um or discernment or whatnot and uh, and sometimes uh at a meeting where i used to work um where uh, they were really good about uh, listening to people who wanted clearness. And uh, usually those committees became support committees mm -hmm. for the same person with the same people on the committee to like, help support them in following through. So it's not uh, just something that it, that it can be a one-time thing, but also it could lend itself like do you have reached clearness in the communal process, but you will always 
have that communal support. Mm -hmm. Like to follow through our next steps and to come back. And like, I want to do this, but I am having a hard time following through and like, that support to like, to be held in love and in the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. to, Good thing what you are being led to do because it's not always easy. What is going back to uh, only Quaker tradition of going out in ministry and mm. pills? Uh, it relates to the Great Commission too. Yeah, I mean, I think that again, that kind of goes that that paradox of like saying like we can experience God directly as individuals is great, but we also know like that can go in all kinds of different directions, and like the voice you hear in your head isn't always God, or maybe most of the time isn't God, you know. And so we need that community as this kind of that context for that. I'm also thinking too of oftentimes when a meeting will take a marriage or a ministry and kind of discern around it. Oftentimes there'll be the language of taking the marriage under the care of the meeting or the ministries under the care of the meeting. And so to me, that really resonates with what you're saying, Greg, of like when, when the clearness committee is over, that doesn't mean the discernment stops or the support stops, but in a way you have, you've made explicit this community that's going to take you under their care that you can go back to and say like, okay, I've been living in this now for a month, several years, and this is how it's going. And those people were there with you. You can kind of check in with them. Um, Jen, I wanted to go back to something you said kind of about knowing that, um, the kind of voice, the inward teacher or the light of Christ within. Cause I think a lot of people, when I explain that to them, they're intrigued by Quakerism and they think, Oh, that sounds great. But then when the rubber meets the road, there's kind of that question of like, well, how do I actually know if I'm, if this leading is from God or if we're in like waiting worship, you know, if I'm being led to speak and you were talking about how sometimes that can be just, there are a lot of different ways we can know that. I think you were talking about kind of the way we feel in our bodies sometimes, but I wonder if you could talk a bit, a little bit about when you're introducing people, especially who might not be familiar with Quakerism to this concept of listening to the inward teacher, what kind of tools you give them for discerning when that's the inward teacher versus my inner critic or just my own, you know, whatever, maybe kind of bouncing around my head or maybe other people's voices in my head. How do you actually, when, when the rubber meets the road, how do we actually discern that voice? Yeah. Well, I mean, that's a question that Quakers have been in conversation yeah. about for a very long time. Yeah. So I don't have a perfect answer to it. But one of the things I walk people through is when you know something is true, what happens for you? Mm. And sometimes that shows up in your body. So where in your body do you feel truth? Um, it could be, you know, like just a, a feeling that you have. Um mm. And it really can manifest differently for different people. Sure. But I think if I, when I ask that question to people, how do you know something is true? Like, where do you feel it? What comes up for you? People usually have some answer to that. They can pick a thing and they're like, oh, I knew that that was true. I knew that was a true thing about me or a thing said about God, or maybe it happened in church or maybe it happened in worship or not. Maybe it happened in school. You're like, that's a true thing. Um, and wherever that shows up for you, or it's it could be a true thing like, you know, in the middle of a conflict, you know, what do you need? Like, how does that show up? Um, and how do you know when you know you need something, how does that show up? And so we can think about what are the markers in our lives that tell us those things. And I can't tell you that for you exactly. I can tell you what it's like for me. You know, I feel it in my heart, in my chest. Yeah. Um, my heart might start beating more. Um, I might start to feel a, a sense of um, just ease and like, but urgency, like this is a thing that I need to to do. That's how I know that I'm called to speak in worship is just like this, this overwhelming sense that this is what I'm supposed to do mm -hmm. that I've only felt in certain circumstances. Yeah. Um, and so to tap into where in your life that shows up can be helpful in figuring out what that looks like for you. Um, I also know like I feel God when I'm in worship. I was a, I did not grow up Quaker. I grew up an evangelical, non-denominational Christian and I led worship. I led worship here actually at Church Fox a little bit for Green Room. And um, I don't know if you still do that, but. I think they have something similar. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, in, in circles, right? So like, you know, we're out at the fire pit, we're playing music, I'm singing to God and like, I know I feel that. And so when I feel that, where else does that show up in my life? And so to, where can we tap in? Um, 
to that when we're discerning these big questions. What does that feel like for you? Um, so I try to walk people through sort of their own language for yeah. for what that feels like for them, and then to know, okay, so what will it look like then? Maybe when you know that the right way forward. But it also doesn't necessarily, it doesn't mean that there's like one moment where you feel like you know the right way forward. One of my favorite quotes is by um, Raina Maria Rilke in mm -hmm. his book, Letters to a Young Poet. Mm -hmm. um, and it's something like, you know, be patient with all that is unresolved in your heart. Mm -hmm. You're going to live the questions um, like locked rooms or books written in a very foreign tongue. Um, but you cannot know the answers now. Um, you have to live your way into the answer. And sometimes it looks like that, and all of a sudden you just know, um, and you just lived your way into the answer. You couldn't just have an answer and make a decision. And so knowing, like, holding those things too, um, that sometimes we just live into what we're called to do, um, and we just take the right next steps, and there's not, like, one big career answer, but we're just following small next steps that are leading us toward where God is calling us to be. And that is something we tried to do with the workshop is uh, because we wanted people to feel empowered, but also have a way of knowing what to do next. So mm -hmm. at the end of the workshop, after they do clearness committee, we ask them, what is the right next step? Mm -hmm. um, and we uh, ask them to break it down and do something that they can do in 15 or 30 minutes. Mm -hmm. uh, no more than 15 to 30 minutes. Like, because, like, we don't want people to leave, like, empowered and then they get back home and, like, I had the big idea, where do I start? So we want them to have that, like, next thing. And, like, it can be uh, one person, their right next step was... Uh, they needed to get organized um, to do, to be able to help support people in their work. So their right next step was going online to staples and buying a um a violin cabinet. Mm -hmm. So it can yeah. be the like small things or writing an email to someone to have a meeting with them or uh, searching, looking online uh, for uh, how to apply apply to a grad program. Like, not applying, but what do you need to apply? Yeah. Do school. No. I think people come away from our the workshop space, the container we're trying to create with this curriculum is not that we have the answers. Mm -hmm. I'm 29 years old. I can tell you I still don't know. I don't have all of the answers to what you should do with your life. I'm still on my own journey with that. Um, but what we can do is leave you with a sense of here's how I tap into my inner wisdom or here are some practices I might use to tap into that. Um, and here's how I might feel held in community around my decisions. And here's a container, the clearness committee, mm -hmm. that I can use to bring people around me to give them a way to support me that's clear and in community. Um, and that I, I might not have all of the answers when I leave the workshop. I, I don't think that you will. Um, but you'll have a sense of feeling held and then a sense of like, here's one small step that I can do that feels like it's in the right direction. And so I think holding um, those things is part of what we're trying to do with our curriculum is that it's an ongoing process throughout your life. And here are some of the tools that can help you at any stage where you're at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One thing I'm hearing in that from both of you is that kind of discernment is relational, mm -hmm. whether it's our relationship to God and how we learn that over time. And it's not the same at all times in our life. Um, and we learn how to listen to, um, the voice of God within a relationship with our community too. And that also that it discernment is ordinary. You know, I think it, especially it's easy for college students who have their whole life ahead of them. It's like, Oh, my vocation, I have to discern it. How do I know it? And like what you're saying, Greg, it's like, well, there are these very ordinary steps. And I think we can, even when you discern a vocation, there's discerning the vocation and then you actually get into it and start living the vocation day to day. And you realize, 
oh, this is a lot more ordinary or there's just a lot more ordinary stuff to this along with maybe the more like firework stuff um, that I hadn't anticipated. And so I think that's something really valuable what you're articulating. Um, and it is ongoing. Like, uh, we are yes. living longer lives mm -hmm. and uh, people are less and less likely to stay in the same career than they were um even 40, 50 years ago for a variety of reasons. So, it, it like you, so you are seeing people moving careers, moving what they do with their lives uh, in different seasons um, of their lives. So, it is also ongoing and just like, um, and knowing that like, you can use the tools at 20, 21, 22 to discern what is at the college, but you can use these skills at 30, 35 to like what do I want to do next? Uh, you can use these skills at the retirement. Um, like what do I do now, now that I don't need to get paid to do work, but like I am 65 or 70, uh, people are coming and like, they are like, what should I do next? Like, yeah, and I think that's so encouraging to hear that you're finding this workshop is resonating with people beyond maybe its original audience or who we might think of as like, oh, like young people need to discern their vocation. And I think it's so, I think it's worth saying how countercultural this can be, especially in America where there's such a big emphasis on your job, your career, what do you do? And people going through life and realizing, you know, it's it's not enough in some ways just to know what I can do, or maybe I'm not doing the same things at different points in my life. I mean, well, as I was looking at your curriculum, one thing I took away is that you kind of want to sh shift the focus from the question of like, kind of, what should I be doing to who am I? Yeah. So it's kind of a distinction between uh, what am I doing versus um, who am I or who am I becoming? Mm -hmm. um, could you talk a little bit about that? What that shift in mindset from, I mean, obviously there are practical things you have to think about. So not trying to say that doesn't matter, but could you say more about how you think about that shift in mindset from focusing on maybe my skills or what I'm doing to like who I am and who I'm becoming? Yeah, I think for me it is, um, I, I've struggled with this a lot of my life that like, uh, because of having a disability, of having a speech impediment, I always feel like I had to prove myself and to always feel like I needed to prove that I was smart by getting good grades. Do that. Um, so for me, it was like a lifelong journey to like figure out that like I am worthy. I am beloved by God for who I am and not what I do. Mm. And it, it like so much of our culture is based on what you do, uh, who, what you own, uh, like your car, your house, how much money you make. And, yeah. but we hear so often those things don't make people happy. They're actually studies as showing those, those people, um, who have a lot of wealth are actually happy or they, I, they can even be more sadder than people who don't have like means. Um, one of the quotes that guides this program is Howard Thurman, who was a black Baptist preacher who was a friend of Quakers. He took a lot from Quakerism in his spiritual life. And uh, he said, um, the world needs people who are, 
who have come alive. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, and, and, and like, what makes you come alive? Is it your work? Or is it about like, what builds your passion for life? Um, and we think that that not only makes for a better person, but uh, that happiness, that fulfillment makes for a better community mm-hmm. uh, is uh, contagious. Mm-hmm. Um, so in our curriculum, when we were doing this, is we put in some visual elements, uh, and one was a map. And right after we started talking, Jen went to a vocational instrument workshop put on by another organization. And she brought back a map that was like, pity you do this, you do that, and you do this. Pretty linear. And... Having and we were talking about it and our paths are not linear at all. And uh and so on our map we um have the biggest part of the map is the unknown. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that. Um discernment as an invitation into unknown and to um, embrace the unknown a little bit. I mean, not, not to romanticize that, but to lean into it. And I think what it takes to do that oftentimes in discernment is a, is trust, Mm -hmm. you know, trust in God, trust in yourself, trust in other people to step forward and not let that unknown being something that's paralyzing or that stops you from living into your vocation. Yeah. When I was a student at Fox, I believe it was Sarita Gallagher. Mm -hmm. I could be wrong. Sarita Gallagher is a professor um, in the College of Christian Studies around missions. But I think she gave a talk in chapel once where she was like, in your life, you're moving forward. And you you don't always know how it feels in the the middle of it. It might feel like the unknown and unclear. And like it definitely doesn't feel linear. Um, I remember her saying that in hindsight, she can see the red thread as God was leading her. Mm. But it wasn't as immediately obvious of like, this is what I'm going to do and this is how I feel. And so when Greg and I talk about it being nonlinear, like I think people tell linear stories about how they got where they are um, because that's how we make meaning. But in the moment of discernment, it doesn't feel that way. It feels like you're wrestling with an unknown dragon or you're in an island of the unknown. And so this is what it looks like to have partners in figuring out our way through that and normalizing that life all like feels like that when we're faced with these questions where we don't know exactly how we're being called and we have to figure that out. Um, And I guess one other piece to pick up in that Howard Thurman quote, um, part of it is that Howard Thurman talks about the sound of the genuine in you. And so I think if we pick up on the the scripture that we're all beautifully and wonderfully made (laughs) and that God has given us all our unique sets of spiritual gifts. So part of figuring out who who we want to be is figuring out who God made us to be, Mm -hmm. us, the sound of the genuine in us. Um, that is uniquely you that God loves and that you want to bring into the world for to be faithful for that purpose to which you're called. Um, and so part of that is figuring out that piece of your life and then where that fits into like how you live it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I love that discernment as the sound of the genuine. Um, well, thank you so much for just writing this curriculum and for coming on and talking with us today. And we really appreciate your perspective on discernment and the ways Quaker principles can help us think about that and can help even audiences beyond Quakers. So thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you for having us, Jay. Yeah. yeah thank you for the opportunity. This video podcast is a production of George Fox Digital. To find more material like this, you can subscribe to George Fox Talks on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. Our team really appreciates your feedback in the form of likes, comments, and reviews, and we'd really love to hear what you think. To sign up for our weekly email list and to keep up to date with the latest episodes and publications, you can check us out on the web at georgefox.edu talks. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you in the next episode.